Good morning, Lakes. Good morning. It is so good to, uh, to be here this morning to uh, see so many of my dear, dear friends. I uh, want you to know that even though it's been a while since I've been here, I was reminded even standing there this morning, the Apostle Paul, he would start many of his letters by saying, I cease not to make mention of you in my prayers always. And I want the Lakes to know that a week does not go by when I don't at least several times pray for this church. And so it's so good to be back here. Whenever I pray for Rosedale, I always include the lakes because I see us as one. Amen? Amen. 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 So it's so good to be here. Uh, when I was in, coming in this morning, Pastor Mark, he met us and he came and greeted us and he, he uh, greeted my mom who's here with us this morning. And then after Mark... Pastor Mark walked away. My mom says, isn't he the pastor? And I said, well, yes, he is. So then she says, well, what are you doing here then? <laughs> so nothing like mom to put you in your place. You all have been looking at a theme, the, uh, the unstoppable movement of God. And I understand you've been looking at the seven churches there in Revelation 2 and 3. And with each one of those churches, God commended them for what they had accomplished, what the good things that they were doing. He also rebuked them for what they needed to do. But the fact of the matter is that the church had made a tremendous impact uh, during the first century. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 17 that these early disciples were credited with turning the world upside down. They made a tremendous impact. And they did not do it by protest. They did not do it by political connections. They did not do it by revolution. It was a very, very simple course that they followed. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that God's chosen method was by the foolishness of preaching that men and women would come to know him, would come to embrace him as Lord and Savior. And so this foolishness of preaching is what caused the church to be so successful in that first century. And so we want to look at some things this morning that we can identify that really helped to make them as successful as they were. Because oftentimes I tend to be somewhat of a critic of the church, but that needs to be balanced with the assurance of knowing that God says that the gates of hell would never prevail against his church. In spite of the fact that we are not all that we should be, in spite of the fact that we are not all that we even want to be, we have the assurance of knowing that the very gates of hell would never prevail against his church. That what God has started, he is going to complete. And the good news is that we are a part of that. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So as we look at our text this morning, uh, we want to look at some things. We looked at, I want to look at, there's a, there actually is a strategy. You know, Jesus tells, he told his disciples in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples of all nations. These were just a small group of believers. And they were told to go and change the world, go and make disciples of all nations. Then in Acts chapter 1, Jesus tells his disciples as he's ascending back to heaven, he says, you shall be witnesses unto me. Again, that small group of people. You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and on to the four corners of the earth. That actually 
happened in the first century. So as we study the book of Acts in the early church and how they were able to accomplish this, there are some things that we can see that we can identify in terms of how they went about it. I call it Paul's strategy for successful ministry. But as I thought more and more about it, I want to somewhat change that because these methods that Paul used are methods that we can use. How we can become more effective in our witness to the world. It was successful for them in that first century in spite of all the odds. And if we would follow that same pattern, we would be successful today in accomplishing the mission that we've been given by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our text is found in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, verses 8 through, 8 through 10. I want you to pray with me that I limit myself to the allotted amount of time. It's been a bit over a year since I've been here, and I've fallen back into my old habits of preaching till I get tired. But this morning, it has been stressed to me, you know, we got other things going on, so you got to, and so the Bible says that the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. So I pray that I stick to my allotted amount of time. But in Acts chapter, chapter 19, I'll read verses 8 through 10, and there's a, there's a sermon notes in your bulletin. You should have received a bulletin. You can just follow along if you don't have your Bibles. But I would encourage you, I hear Pastor Mark always encouraging you to bring your Bibles. And it's very important that you do bring your own Bibles because when you have your own Bible, not the church Bibles, your own Bibles, and you can make notes and you can scribble and you can highlight and those kind of things, and it helps you with your study even as you leave on Sunday morning. But reading from Acts chapter 19, beginning at verse 8, it says, And Paul entered the synagogue, and for three months he spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, Paul withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannius. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of God, both Jews and Greeks. So that all the residents of Asia heard the word of God. How was this accomplished? Well, we're given some clues here in the text that we've just read. It says he spoke boldly, he reasoned and persuaded, and then he continued to teach the disciples. And so those are the three points that we want to look at this morning in terms of <laughs> establishing our own strategy for how we can actually accomplish this mission that we've been given. How can we become more effective witnesses? And the first thing that we see is that Paul says, or, or Luke as he writes the account, he says they spoke boldly. That means to be fearless. See, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed. In order for us to accomplish the mission, we have to be fearless. God has not given us a spirit of fear, the Bible says, but of power and love and a sound mind. And yet, statistics tell us that approximately 80% of believers never share their faith on a regular basis. One of the excuses that I, that's given is fearfulness. I don't know how I'll be received. I don't know if I'll stumble across my words. I don't know if I'll be asked a question I cannot answer. So whatever it is, 
We are negligent in doing what we've been commanded as followers of Christ to do. But it says here of this early church, Paul and his companions, it says they spoke boldly, without fear, without fear. But the other thing that word means is not just to, not just to be fearless, but it also means to be confident to be confident in the message. Confident in what? Confident in their skills? No, not so much confident in their skills, but confident in the source of their power. Because again in Acts chapter 1, Paul, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why was he not ashamed? It says because he understood that it was the power of God. The power of God unto salvation. One of the great assurances that we have, particularly as followers of Christ, and especially for us that proclaim the gospel as preachers, we've been told by the word of God that God's word will never return unto him void. Every time he sends the word out, he says it will accomplish its purpose. It can commend us or it can condemn us. But either way, it's going to accomplish his purpose. So one of the things that helps me get over my fear of communicating the gospel is that it's not completely left up to me. The Holy Spirit that works in me, the word of God that is the power of God, the gospel is the power of God, to change people's lives. And so when I share my faith, I share my faith with a clear understanding that it's not just me. It's the Holy Spirit that's working not just in me, but in the hearts of my hearers. My job is not to convert the world. My job is to communicate the message. And so several, a couple weeks ago, I had a friend that came into town, and this is a friend that I haven't seen in over 40 years. Actually, actually, uh, when I was here at the lakes, he came into town, and he was trying to locate me, and somehow he found my name associated with the Lakes Community Church. Without question, he was not looking for my name to be associated with the church. He had not seen me in over 40 years. But somehow we connected and so he's been coming into town a couple of times a year and he's been seeing me and we come into, he comes into town and there's a group I play pinochle with on Friday night and so he comes and he plays pinochle with us. My daughter asked me the other day, are y'all gambling? No, we're not gambling. We're just a fun game. And so we play, we've been playing Pete Uncle now for almost a couple of years, and he'll come in, we'll play, and then he goes home. So he calls me a few weeks ago. He says, I'm coming to town, and while I'm there, he says, I want to come to your church. And I'd never said anything to him about what I do, but he saw that there was something different. He recognized that there was something different. I've been praying, God, I want you to give me an opportunity to share my faith with him. Uh, I understand he does not know me this way, but it's very clear that there's a difference from the guy he knew 40 years ago. And so we came in and, and we went out to lunch last week and I've been praying, Lord, help me. Give me an opening to share my faith. And so I use my skills, my background is in sales, and so um, I know how to direct the conversation. That's one of the things I was taught. And so I asked a couple of leading questions that, were in, that was intended to direct the conversation the way I wanted it to go. Guess what? He didn't take the bait. He didn't take the bait. 
And so when our meeting was over, I was a bit disappointed. Lord, you know I wanted to share my faith. I, I, I asked you to, to, to give me an opening, prepare his heart to receive it. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. And so I was somewhat down uh, after that meeting. He called me the other day and he says, uh, Greg, I've been thinking about what you said. Now, I just want you to know how much I appreciate our friendship. That was all he said. Now, I was disappointed by the fact that he did not, that conversation did not go the way I wanted it to go. But after getting off the phone, I was reminded by the Holy Spirit, I believe, it's not your job to convert him. See, let your light shine before men. They will see your good works and they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. As I continue to let my light shine, God is going to give me another opportunity. I'm convinced of that. Because the Bible tells me that no man comes to God, first of all, unless the Holy Spirit draws him. So, we are instructed to always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. And as I was sharing my disappointment with another friend of mine the other day, he was reminding me of that very verse. Always be prepared to give an answer. And he says, Greg, before you can give an answer, there has to be a question. He never questioned you. So wait for the Spirit of God to raise within his heart the question so that you can answer. See, this, this, this thing of salvation is the job of the Holy Spirit. All he wants us to do, I don't need to be uh, 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 handicapped by my fears. All I have to do is be prepared to give the answer when he's asked. When it's asked. And so the Bible says here that they spoke boldly and they spoke confidently. Paul was completely confident in the power of the Holy Spirit to touch the heart of that soul that God had prepared to hear the message. They spoke boldly. Then the Bible also says that they reasoned and persuaded their hearers concerning the message. They argued persuasively. Over and over and over again, the Bible tells in the book of Acts, whenever the apostle Paul would go into a city, it says he would go to the city square. If there was a synagogue, he would go to the synagogue. And the Bible says he would reason with his hearers. He would reason with his hearers. The ideal of, actually the definition of reasoning is to mingle thought with thought. What, would that, that, what does that mean? He reasoned with them. See, that's a bit more, requires a bit more skill than just being bold. First of all, you have to know what you're talking about. And that's the importance of us studying the Word of God. We don't study the Word of God just for the sake of studying it. We don't just know the Word of God in order to impress our fellow believers so that we can reason with those that have legitimate questions. Paul was able to do that. He, he, he had acquired the skill of knowing how to reason with his audience. It didn't matter the setting. It didn't matter who he was talking to, whether it was Jew or Gentile, because he knew how to make that connection. That's a skill that needs to be acquired by all of us. As I think about that, one of the most familiar stories in the Bible is the story of David and Goliath. One of the questions that I ask 
about that story. How was David able to defeat this giant of an enemy? In David's own words, is that the God that I serve will give me victory. His confidence was in the God that he served, but it wasn't only in the God that he served. Because when he told King Saul, the God that I serve will give me victory, the next verse says King Saul armed him with all of the armor of of a, of a soldier. And little David is weighed down with all this armor. And David says to Saul, I can't fight with all of this armor on. Because one, I've never been trained with this armor. I don't know how to use it. He says, but what I've been trained with is what? A slingshot. David says, I can take a slingshot and I can do some damage. He knew what he was qualified. He knew what he was equipped to do. Then he goes and he tells, he says, I've killed lions and bears with this slingshot. What we learn from that story is that David had perfected the use of a slingshot. So when he faces Goliath, he says, I've killed a lion and a bear with this slingshot, and I can kill this giant. His faith, his confidence was in what? Was in, his confidence was in his own skillfulness but not just his skillfulness. I'm sure many of you watched the World Series the other night. On paper, the team that was the most skillful, the team that was supposed to win, lost. Everything said the Dodgers would win, except Houston. It takes more than just the skill. The skill is important. The skill is necessary. And so David was skillful with this sword or skillful with this slingshot, but his confidence was also, was not just in his slingshot. His confidence was also in the God that he served. To argue persuasively, to reason with those that we come into contact with is a skill that all of us must acquire. And to think that you can never acquire it is to defeat yourself before you even get started. Let me give you a a fact of the Bible. This same Paul that argued and defended the cause of Christ was the same one when he was first converted that caused all kind of confusion. See, he was fearless, but he didn't know what he was doing. And he caused the apostles so much trouble that the apostle said, the other apostle said, let's send this fella home. He's causing us too much trouble. And for almost 14 years, no one heard of the apostle Paul. He was fearless, but he had not acquired the skill. Fourteen years later, now that the skill has been acquired, now he is one of the men who has said of him, he's turning the world upside down. He had acquired the skill. And so when you look at, when you look at, the, 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 the method that Paul would use when he goes into in Acts chapter uh, 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 either 17 or 19 when he goes into, into Athens it says he was troubled as he walked around this great city and he saw that they worshipped many gods and in the course of his, of, his, of his survey he says he noticed that one of the statues 
represented the unknown God. And he says to the people of that town, I see that you worship many gods. I also see that there's a God here that you call the unknown God. That unknown God, the one whom you do not know his name, is the one that I've come to proclaim to you. And then he gives his presentation of the gospel. Skill. Skill is being able to take, to be able to relate to people, to relate to them on their level. So when Jesus would teach, and he was the master teacher, he was teach by telling stories. And in fact, what I've come to believe is that God's chosen, particularly as I study the Old Testament, God's chosen method of communicating his message to the world is by way of stories. All the way through the Old Testament is stories. We have the story of Abraham, the story of, of Isaac and Jacob, and the story of Moses, the story of David. These stories are intended to teach us the ways of God. So when Jesus came and he, taught, he, he told stories to his audience, he would try to explain to them the kingdom of God, and he would say, the kingdom of God is like this. Then he'd do what? He'd tell a story. He connected them with something that they could already understand to help them to understand the deep truths, things that they could not understand. That's a skill that all of us must acquire. Then the third thing I see in this text, as we come to a, a, a rapid close, the third thing that I see in this text, <laughs> I'm going to make it. The third thing I see in this text, it says in verse 9, but when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way, they were not called Christians back then. They were called followers of the way. So these stubborn hearers, speaking evil of the way, it says, when they did this, that Paul withdrew from them with the disciples, those that wanted to hear, those that wanted to learn, those that were committed to, to, to following the teachings of the way. And it says, for two years, he discipled them, preparing them to accomplish the mission that God has given to us. A disciple is a follower. A disciple is one that has committed himself to the student-teacher relationship. Jesus told, chose 12. They became his disciples. They followed him and they learned from him. Paul, the early church, as they made believe, as they as they as they made converts, those converts were converted into disciples. Because a disciple is one that learns and follows. Jesus had a whole lot to say about discipleship. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus says this. He says, if anyone desires to follow me. If anyone desires to follow me. The first thing I see in that statement is that it's not a command. He doesn't command me to. He says, if you desire. The choice is mine. See, I believe one can be a believer without being a disciple. Because a disciple, to be a disciple, you have to make a choice to be a disciple. If, he says, if anyone desires to follow me, he says three things. One, he says he must, he or she must deny himself. That means to give up your rights. 
in our Bible study during the week, we've been talking about one of the things that we were talking about in terms of how you actually live out this Christian life. I challenge the class to practice saying no to sin. When I'm tempted, Paul tells me in Romans chapter 6, when you are tempted to do something wrong, when you are tempted to say the wrong thing, when you're tempted to do the wrong thing, when you're tempted to have the wrong attitude, Paul says you can counter that by saying no. Just say no. And so I gave that as an assignment to our class, and I took the same assignment upon myself. So last week we had some that shared their testimonies about how successful they were. And one lady was telling me, she said, I felt like I had a right to defend myself. The person, that, the person that challenged me was wrong. I had a right to defend myself. And I had to say to her, no, you didn't. You don't have a right. Jesus says you must deny yourself. That means you give up your right. Sometimes it means you give up your right to be right. You give up your right to respond in the way you've always responded when people say or do something against you. Jesus says you must first of all deny yourself. Then he says take up your cross. What does that mean? It means be prepared to suffer. Take up a cross. The cross represented the most cruel suffering. But Jesus says, if you desire to be a disciple, you must commit yourself to being prepared to suffer. I don't like to suffer. But it's impossible to be a disciple without accepting that as part of the responsibility. If anyone desires to follow me, deny himself, take up his cross, and do what? And follow me. The problem with following Jesus is that you don't know where he'll take you. I want to know where I'm going. I want to know so I can make a decision. Do I want to go or not? Jesus said that doesn't work like that. Take up the cross and follow me. And what I've learned is many of the places that he'll take me my places, I don't want to go. I don't want to go there. But you know what he says? He says in Luke chapter 14, if you are not prepared to do this, he says you cannot be my disciple. If I'm not prepared to deny myself, if I'm not prepared to take up my cross, and if I'm not prepared to follow, he says, you cannot be my disciple. The early church made the impact that they made because they were committed to speaking boldly, to reasoning and persuading men to follow Christ into making and being disciples. And if we would follow that same pattern, the church today will be just as unstoppable as a first century church. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word because your word is always a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our pathway. It's your word that that gives understanding. It's your word that illumines things, that helps us to see things from your perspective. The way that I see things is not the way that things should be seen. Father, as we've seen from the early church the success that they had, Father, we want to be just as successful. Help us to apply these principles so that we can accomplish the mission that you've left us here to accomplish. And Father, we thank you even for this time this morning.
because we know that your word will not return unto you void. It's in your son's name that we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. All right. At this time, we're going to go right into our, our, our baptismal service, and I'm so happy to be here this morning to witness this baptismal service. Because when one is baptized, they're actually identifying with the cause of Christ, which is the first step to becoming a disciple. And so we sit back and rejoice together as we witness the baptism of these dear souls. Amen? Amen. Amen. Pass it on. I'll turn over to Pastor Mark. Good morning, Lakes. How's everybody doing? Good. Thanks, Pastor Greg, for that message. And uh, we're just going to move on our service to one of my favorite things. Uh, with that baby dedication is, is becomes baptism. Is some of my favorite things to celebrate. So we're going to hear some great stories here this morning. And what we celebrate at the lakes is what we believe the scriptures teach. That you get baptized as a believer in Jesus. That's after you make a decision to follow Jesus. Uh, it says to get baptized. And that's simple as that. Is that when you go in the water, you're identifying with the death of Christ. And when you come up, you identify with his resurrection, that you really belong to him. And it's a public testimony of what Christ has done for you and what he means for you. So we got some awesome stories here. And before we jump into that, though, I want to say this, is that if you feel the spirit moving or you feel like it's time for you to make that decision, we are just right out in the hallway and we have space here for you to get baptized spontaneously. That it is a decision you can, you can make it this morning. The only requirement is you believe in Jesus, no matter how long or how short you've been a believer. You can do that this morning. So we're going to be out here. We got shorts to close to change. We got clothes to change into. We got towels. We got everything you need. So don't let those be an excuse. Uh, you can come out here and get baptized. So with that being said, I want to introduce to you Jeff Lakowski. He's going to come up and share with uh, what God has been doing in his life and his decision here. First off, I thought Pastor Mark knew me well enough not to give me a microphone. Uh, apparently, he doesn't know me that well. Uh, so I'm coming here today. Uh, when I was an infant, like many of you, uh, my parents chose for me to be baptized. And throughout my life, I've had God in my life. I have gone to church, and he has been an integral part of who I am and what I've become. And recently, Pastor Mark came to me and asked if I wanted to be baptized today. And my response to him was, yeah, but I'm not ready. And through a lot of soul searching, uh, bringing it up at my small group, talking with friends, uh, sitting down and having a great meeting with Pastor Mark, I realized I've wanted to be baptized, but I've been waiting for this epiphany, this coming to Jesus, if you will, uh, for me to say, yeah, I'm ready to be baptized. And through this, this search, I realized that it already happened and that this epiphany and coming to Jesus wasn't going to happen because I, I already know who Christ is and he's already a part of who I am. So I come here today to publicly show that I identify with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And today I choose to be baptized, and it is my sermon for you today. Um, for many of you that are out there where I've sat, um, when Pastor Mark does do the spontaneous baptisms, I've always been reluctant to do so, uh, whether it was nerves or embarrassment or what have you. Um, but I'd just like to pose to you the same question that he posed to me, and that's what are you waiting for? So thank you very much. Jeff, do you believe that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior? I do. With that being said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. so if I babble, please excuse me. Um, I see this baptism as a journey from darkness to light for me. Um, I always, for many years, I thought my past was God's condemnation of me and that he had turned his back on me. But I realize now that God was always with me and that he gave me the incredible skills to survive 
And I'm ready to go from being a survivor to a thriver, to somebody who's living uh, life with God. Uh, I don't know how else to describe it. Um, he's orchestrated some very special people in my life who've helped me get to this point, and I know they'll continue to help me, you know, throughout the rest of my journey. And that includes Pastor Mark, who's very patient and very persistent. So um, I thank God so much for what he's orchestrated in my life, and I'm ready to move on. Kenley, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? I do. With that being said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. service we'll have the baptismal open if you want to come out at any time at all to get baptized we'll be moving that way and uh, with that being said I just want to send it back to Pastor Greg into the service and uh, as he gives a benediction thank you God bless you let's all stand to be dismissed and as as we uh, as we pray and ask God's blessings as we go out of the sanctuary this morning let me uh, just reiterate something that Pastor Marks encouraged. You know, one of the things that's evident about the, uh, the first century church, there was no such thing as a believer that had never been baptized. As soon as they believed, they were baptized. And so we praise God for these fearless souls that obeyed the Lord this morning in baptism. But if you're one of those that's reluctant for whatever reason, let me encourage you that the first step to following Christ is to obey him in water baptism. If you are a believer, then you need to be baptized. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so once again for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this service. We thank you, Lord, for these that have obeyed you, that have made this public proclamation of being willing to identify with you, of being willing to become a disciple. Father, we ask that you would continue to bless them and encourage them and grow. Father, we thank you for this service today. We thank you, Lord, for each one that's in attendance. Father, our prayer is that you have been pleased with our worship of you. And Father, now as we dismiss, keep us mindful that you're sending us out into a world that's in desperate need of the good news of the gospel. Dismiss us now, Lord, with the blessing. Make us a blessing to others. And we'll thank you for it. For it's in your son's name we pray with thanksgiving. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. amen. God bless you and have a great day. <laughs>